you, uh, Comrade Jean. Thank you very much. Uh, please just hold on to that microphone because in this part of the program, I've just got a few questions that I will uh, feel to each of the panelists, and uh, if you can be very brief in your in your responses because we want to hand over to the public so they can respond. Uh, but uh, Comrade Jean, uh, just a couple of things. Number one. Um, we have heard from the panelists here, and it's certainly an objective of the finance minister to raise it as much revenue as he can, which is why we've seen increases in duties on various things, vehicles, for instance, amongst others. One of the key problems or the key enemies of this state that has been identified in recent times is corruption. Failure of this government to act on corruption. Don't you see a problem where even if duties are raised, all it will do is fuel even more corruption because what the people at the borders will simply say is, look, Nezoro I would cut 500 because Juti Akwila and Aukida 1,000. But still, uh, you know, there will be leakages in that regard because we have not tackled the, 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 the deep-rooted issue of corruption. So I'd like to hear a response on that. Number two, I suppose the big question that uh, uh, many lay people will ask, for instance, my mother often asks, you know, we see, we see the Russians here now, the Chinese are here now, and they're doing all these things and making all these promises, what is it that we are giving in return to them? And I suppose that begs the question of something that has always been pointed out of, uh, you know, the former deputy prime minister used to say, when we box, let's box smart. When we are doing all these deals, are we really ensuring that 20 years, 30 years down the line, our children, grandchildren will not uh, face any uh, unfair or disadvantages because of what is being done today? Those two to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, but I, but again, uh, let, let me start off with, uh, with your question on corruption. Look, corruption is wrong. We should all fight to make sure that we don't have corruption in this country. And uh, I think that's it. And I've put that question to bed. But failure what to we, act on it. We should make sure that we act on it. But yeah, let's not get, get diverted from what we're talking about. We are talking about the economy. We are talking about the mid-term a fiscal policy statement. And let's talk about that. Let's not start look for because let's not look for my headlines. Because once we start we continue doing that, we take our eye off the ball. And this is one of the major problems that we have as a nation is taking our eye off the economic ball because we're looking at something else. Yes, let's work at making sure that we deal with corruption and we, we, we sort out this uh, issue of corruption. The Chinese and, uh, and, the, and uh, the, the Russians. I will give an example of, uh, of, of Kariba Hydro South, uh, South Extension. Now, that is funded by uh, credit from China. And that credit from China is for the purchase Oh, for, it's for, a, for an EPC contract, for an engineering, procurement, and construction contract. And that EPC contract is for procuring equipment that is manufactured in China to be able to, in, to, to, to add an extra 300 megawatts onto the national grid. But that is actually uh, a loan. It is not something that uh, the Zimbabweans are getting for free. It is a loan. That, they, that, that we're getting. We will have to pay back that loan. And this is why it was necessary for the Minister of Finance to pay $180 million so that if we could get back into good books with Sino, with I think it's Sinocred, Sinoshow, thank you very much. You see, with Sinoshow, so that at least we're able to pay back but one of the things that we need to also be doing when we're getting those loans is we need to start ring-fencing the revenues from those loans. And that particular arrangement has got an escrow account and it's got a power purchase agreement, seating of a power purchase agreement, so that that loan does not become a bad loan. So those are the things that we should be looking at when, we, when, we start, when, when we're looking at those, uh, at those issues. It also becomes necessary that Parliament and the opposition do their work properly. The role of opposition is to make sure that government performs properly. And here I'm looking at my colleagues here, very well educated, very, very smart. 
I really hope that they will make sure that all of the loans that we get are put to good use. And I, that, is, that is their role. But, but it, beca it, it becomes difficult. It becomes difficult if all the time the opposition is crying wolf, crying wolf. People stop listening to them, including themselves. They stop listening to themselves because they're all politicking. And this is the point that I've made in my intervention, that let's look at the facts. Let's be responsible because we only have one Zimbabwe. Please, may you hand over the microphone to Honorable Mashakara. I was going to ask you another question, but I think I would be, uh, you know, being unfair. I mean, you do mention that Parliament has a role to play in ensuring that these loans are good. They will equally argue without consulting us first. So now you want us to superintend over something that we didn't have an input on. But I think we, we can tackle that a bit later. Honorable Mashakada, very quickly to you. Sometimes it is medicine, all medicine is, is bitter. And so perhaps these measures that are being introduced are a bitter pill that we perhaps need to take at this point. The minister doesn't have much leeway, so he's looking for revenue wherever he can get it. And um, you talk about FDI, realistically, how can he uh, attract that? Uh, right now, we are playing ball with the Chinese and the Russians because they are the ones who are willing to play ball. How do we engage people who uh, seemingly don't want to, to come to the party? Thank you. Capital is a coward. For you to attract capital into the country, you have to put measures that makes investors feel secure, that their capital is protected, is safe, and that you can incentivize the flow of capital to your country. I'll just give you some few figures. As I sit here, Mozambique has been able to attract FDI to the tune of $3 billion annually. South Africa, $5 billion annually. Angola, $8 billion FDI annually. It is about improving the investment climate in the country and reducing the political risk in the country and make sure that you don't change laws for the investors. They want policy consistency, policy certainty, and to make sure that once you say you've got a law, you won't run away from the law. But in the, in, in the context of, of, of the bubble, we've got an elephant in the living room, the 51%. A threshold on indigenization. I'll, I'll bet you my last dollar, no investor will put money on the table for you to take 51%. That doesn't happen. But they borrow this money from capital markets and financial markets. So unless we improve our doing business environment and make sure that capital is a good return, the other problem is that do we respect the agreement that we sign? You sign a BIPA, Today, tomorrow, you violate it. If you don't believe in the people, don't sign it in the first place. So it's about playing according to the rules of capital. We are talking money, we are talking huge money, we are talking about huge business. We need to, to scale up the game when it comes to investment promotion and investment protection. What you're talking about, again, Senator, I think you made the point earlier about perception, that it's a perception issue now. If we did all those things and said, look, we've removed the 51%, we've done all this, that capital will not come this month or in two, they will wait to see if indeed we are sincere. During that waiting period, what is to be done? Let me tell you, it's not about perception. First of all, perception can be valid, like in our case. What happened with the ESA deal, if it's perception, we lost huge potential investment from ESA, from the Indian, the largest steel giant. Because we can't lock in that investment, that FDI. We keep on changing the rules. And ESA is thinking of relocating from Zimbabwe. So I'm giving you one practical example. There was some ethanol investor who is now setting up shop in Zambia. After going through bureaucratic hurdles, when I was Minister of, of Investment, I set up a one-stop shop investment uh, window so that all government departments would be able to cooperate. An investor gets all the papers under one roof. But ever since I left government, nobody is keen to follow through and implement 
that very good structure. So you see, there are practical problems which have to be addressed. Our laws, we need to harmonize all laws to make sure that we don't need an investment. Comesa can help us to do that. The World Bank can help us to harmonize all our laws so that they don't scam by investment. Honorable Miti, I know I, I did cut you off earlier when you, you did say this government is clueless and it sounded like you are on the verge of giving us some clues on how to solve this economic problem. So I'll allow you to do that, but there is something that I would like to, as a layman, and you've just mentioned it today, that the speaker has declared what happened last week in Allen Void. What does that actually mean? You know, what, what is the significance of that? Well, from a constitutional point of view, it means that... Uh, the statement by Chinamasa is null and void. Therefore, anything that was done consistent with that, pursuant to that, is also null and void. So, so no five percent tax on air time. Absolutely, absolutely. So he has to he has to start afresh, and I don't know how he's going to unscramble the scrambled egg. But it's, it's a real it's a real disaster. <laughs> okay, very quickly onto the onto coming out of this depression that you mentioned. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you for that. But just a small thing, because I think the public is entitled to know this. It is on the, on the Kariba South extension, which the president was in uh, Kariba uh, unveiling or launching last week. That agreement was negotiated by the inclusive government. I signed that particular agreement. <laughs> no, but that's not my point. That's not my point. My point is, when we signed that agreement, it was $198 million. So I don't know how $198 million mutates into $530 million. <laughs> and this, is, this question is key because your question was on corruption. How does $198 million mutate into $530 million? But the second thing, the second thing which I want to mention is that what is happening at Karipa is very simple. Zambia did it with the same company, Sino Hydro. They put two generators on northern Zambezi. They're just putting two generators. So we are also putting two generators on southern Zambezi. It cost the Zambians less than 200 million US dollars. How is it going to cost Zimbabwe twice that, that amount? So this is the question which the public must, must interrogate. So we want the project, yes, but no to, no to corruption. But I want to come to the, to the solution. Zimbabwe needs a holistic, multifaceted approach to the current crisis. The first issue, of course, which is beyond the realm of this uh, debate, is, of course, resolution of the political crisis, resolution of the crisis of legitimacy, resolution of the contested issue around the 31st of July election resolution of strengthening the issue of the rule of law in Zimbabwe, resolution of uh, completing the constitutional agenda and aligning the Zimbabwe laws to the constitution. So that's political. So you need a canon A that deals with the politics. Without dealing with the politics, this country will not move because this country is subordinated and imprisoned to politics. What Number two, you, yeah, let, let has, 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 has the rest of Zimbabwe not moved on from these disputes that you speak of? Are they on, not... Uh, on, on, the uh, contrary, on the contrary, you can rig elections, but you can rig an economy. So the economy is reflecting the true result of 31st uh, July. <laughs> so, 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 that, that is in fact what is happening. That is in fact what is happening. But, I, but I, want to come, I want to come to to the technical details, to the technical details of dealing with this uh, economy. I think you need about to do about 10 things beyond the political issues. The first thing that we need to do is to accept that the country is not producing. So the buzzword is production. What supply side reforms can we carry out to ensure that the mines are functioning, the manufacturing sector is functioning, Capacity utilization is back to a situation of 80 to 100 percent. In the immediate short term, we need capital. We need capital in the form of foreign direct investment. We need capital in the form of overseas development assistance, your fiscal diamond, Dr. Kanyenzi. 
we need capital in the form of domestic sales. We are never going to get foreign direct investment because of what is described as the elephant in the living room called the Indigenization and Empowerment Act. With great respect, we need to repeal, not amend, repeal the Indigenization Empowerment Act. Send scholars somewhere to Kariba, to Nyanga, with the beautiful holiday resorts in Zimbabwe. Let our experts come up with a new program for broad-based empowerment as a visit in the constitution of Zimbabwe. But the Indigenization Empowerment Act, no. Let's attract foreign direct investment. Number two, we need to resolve Zimbabwe's debt crisis. It's not a debt crisis because we, devote, we defaulted as way back as 1999. When I was in government, I was in Zimbabwe, but I was in Zimbabwe, it was in 1999. So it's not a debt issue, it's a development issue. And I'll tell you why. The World Bank is sitting with over $200 billion for Africa. Donald Kabiluka in the African Development Bank is sitting with over $30 billion for Southern Africa. Zimbabwe can't access those funds because we, we have got those areas. No one will lend money to a defaulter. So we need to deal with the question of uh, uh, the debt question and restore our relations with the World Bank and the IMF because it's a precondition to access the international markets. Number three, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Rapporteur, we need to deal with the question of gross capital formation, the question of infrastructure. We need at least $4 billion on electricity generation alone. Those are the Chinese deals. I'll come to the Chinese deals. <laughs> we need, we need the close to $2 billion on roads. Our road network is about 88,000 kilo, 88, kilometers. Of that, less than 14 a thousand kilometers is paved. Even that which is paved is falling to pieces. In some areas, it's easier to move on gravel than to move on the third uh, surface. We need close to $2 billion on just ICT, the fiber optic uh, infrastructure, the last mile infrastructure, and so forth. So that's infrastructure. Zimbabwe has not invested in gross capital formation since 1968. And as I used to say when I was Minister of Finance, if you wake up someone who died in Harare, who died in 1968, you will not get lost. He might be confused by Jameson Avenue, which is now Samora Mansion Avenue, but you will not get, uh, you will not get, uh, uh, you will not get lost. Number five, Comrade Chairman, we need to be fully integrated in the community of nations. It's not about looking east or west or south. It's about looking forward and make sure that Zimbabwe is totally reintegrated in the community of nations. So we need the relations with New York, we need the relations with London, yes, we need the relations with Beijing, with the Singapore, uh, and, 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 and with the Delhi. So we are such a tiny little country. Let's normalize relations with every country and not be past masters of explicitives against every country which is functioning. Uh, number six, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Chairperson, we need to move away from agriculture, which is based on a handout philosophy. If you look at the budget, $253 million to hand out to, can we construct our agriculture so that it's run on a business model? Number one, let's put a full stop to the land question, the political question. Invasions are taking place. There are farmers who are losing land right now. Let's stop the invasions. Number two, let's give some form of title to every person on land. Before 1979, 74% of bank lending went through to agriculture. So farming has always been financed by the banking sector. But no one will lend money when there's no form of title. And without bank, without the land resolution of the land crisis, it means there's no financial intermediation. Let's restore the land market in Zimbabwe. So the land question is key in Zimbabwe. And it, it is a developmental question in Zimbabwe. And this is where I differ with Zanfir. Because they will not give people title, even a long list, because to do so, people will become free and free with their minds and free with their votes. So we need to, to resolve uh, 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 the next question. <laughs> Lastly, Mr. Chairman, we need macroeconomic stability. The essence of any economics is we eat what we kill. And if I have got anger against Patrick Chinamasa, it is as a result of jettisoning that principle. 